Okay, let's open our Bibles to Psalm 148. Psalm 148. And let's read the first six verses there. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. God is to be praised twelve times uh, throughout this psalm. Uh, I'll give the references three times in verse 1 alone. Uh, two times each in verses 2 and 3. One time in verse 4. One time in verse 5. One time in verse 7. One time in verse 13. And again, one time in verse 14. Twelve is Israel's number, and it's the number by which God will regulate all things and all people, ultimately. There were twelve patriarchs, tw or twelve sons of Jacob, if you will. Um, twelve birthstones were in the breastplate of the high priest. There are twelve gates around the city walls of Jerusalem. There are twelve Jewish apostles in the New Testament. <coughs> There are 12 months on the calendar here. Um, and those of you who are musical, uh, much more musical than I, there are 12 half notes um, on a chromatic scale. There's an A flat, A, B flat, B, C, D flat, D, E flat, rather, yeah, E flat, E, F, F sharp, and G. And there are 12 main colors in the spectrum. They come from three primary colors. The three primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. And those 12 main colors are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. And then in between those six colors, there are, there are uh, combination colors. Um, vermilion, amber, chartreuse, teal, violet, and magenta. You'll have to look those words up in the dictionary or an encyclopedia to see the exact uh, colors because I can never keep those exotic words straight in my mind. Um, and there have been 12 traditional constellations to the zodiac. Although they, they, they do, you've heard of Virgo and Leo and Capricorn and so forth, well, although they do suggest a 13th constellation uh, suggested, which is called Ophiuchus, O-P-H-I-U-C-H-U-S, and uh, the name of that word, it, the name of that word means the serpent holder. And I'm not sure. I'd have to do more research as to what that might, how that might correspond to something scripturally or prophetically. But notice first that the praises of God begin from the heavens, verse 1, which must include ye heaven of heaven, down in verse 4, and ye waters that be above the heavens, verse 4. And that throws off most modern translating committees. That doesn't match modern science. Uh, so you find the Bible's warning against science falsely so called, 1 Timothy 6, 20, removed out of all modern Bibles. The Bible says, beware of science falsely so called. And the word science has been taken out of every modern translation, and instead they read, beware of certain kinds of knowledge. And without any warning against science, the generations that grow up reading those modern Bibles end up thinking that science is pretty, pretty good. Science is really something. And science has uh, so many answers to man's questions. I, found, I saw an interesting book, I wish I had bought it when I first seen it, about scientific blunders 
over the centuries, things that the experts claimed were scientific proof and scientific uh, uh, facts that turned out to be just nonsense later on. I've got a book at home. It was a, a book of, you know, sort of an encyclopedic uh, uh, book of knowledge written about 1930, 31, along in there. And they have an a illustration in the book of what the moon supposedly is shaped like. And uh, since the moon doesn't rotate, we see the same side of the moon all the time, and there's the, there's the dark side behind it. They, they conjectured in about 1930 that the moon was actually oblong. And we're looking at one end of it from our perspective. And there's this long, elongated shape uh, hidden behind it that we don't see. But it appears round to us because we only see one end of it, uh, and so on. And so science is not always right uh, about all things. But when they say, the waters which be above the heavens, that is scriptural, even if it's not accepted by modern science. Uh, and it's worth um, running through some charts that I made along these lines. And these are, this is the scripture's display of God's creation and the shape of the universe. It goes like this. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Those are the first two things God mentions that he created. In the beginning. When was that? Well, it was in the beginning. That's all you need to know. <laughs> then, we're told in the New Testament, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. 2 Peter 3, verse 5. At some point, God decreed that he fill the universe with water. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Then he says in 2 Peter 3, verse 6, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And then you go to Genesis 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the entire earth was covered with water uh, in the universe at one time, Genesis 1, verse 2. Then we go to later, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So this would be the firmament, which we call the second heaven. In here is all the constellations, all the, all the galaxies, and everything we see in the known universe around us. And waters which be above the heavens, waters below the heavens. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the heavens, um, uh, rather, the, under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8. This is what we call the second heaven. So, the shape of the universe is more than likely something like this. Although this is not a very good piece of artwork. You ever, th you ever think that the capstone is missing on the Great Pyramid of Giza? Nobody knows who built the pyramids for e either. But the capstone is missing. And uh, in here is what we would consider the visible universe, outer space. Every galaxy, every star cluster, every constellation, uh, every sun, every other uh, solar system. Uh, the firmament above the, uh, the waters above the firmament, the waters below the firmament. And up here, a sea of glass also called the face of the deep, which is frozen, Job 38, verse 30. Uh, Revelation 4, verse 6, call it a sea of glass, above which would be the third heaven. And somewhere between here and there, you'd find the North Star. That, 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 another subject, I mentioned it a few times, we have never really dwelt upon it in any detail, but as I was preparing this this morning, it came to my mind, and I've talked to you about the stationary earth. Now, we don't believe in a flat earth. We believe in a round earth. I saw an interesting cartoon someone had put together. It had the sun, and 
all the nine planets in our solar system, and all of them round except the Earth was flat. You know, <laughs> how inconsistent could that possibly be? So we don't believe in a flat Earth, but I, I tend, I'm tending more and more to believe in a stationary Earth. Do you realize that whether the Earth goes around the Sun, or the Sun and all the constellations go around the Earth, you and I would still witness the same phenomenon in space when we looked at the stars at night. We'd see the same things, whether we're going around the Sun or the Sun's going around us. We are, set, we are told that the Earth is rotating at a thousand miles per hour, that the Earth is, has a circumference of 24,000 miles around, and so it takes 24 hours for the Earth to make one complete rotation. But beside that 1,000 mile an hour rotation, we are also said to be hurtling through space at 66,000 miles per hour around the Sun. It takes us in a year to make that entire uh, trip. But beside the 66,000 miles per hour, we are said to be racing through space, the moon is also orbiting around us. Which means that the moon must be traveling faster than 66,000 miles per hour to keep an orbit around us and, and, and to travel with us, correct? If you fix your camera on the North Star when the sun goes down, and on a clear night, you can see other stars in the, in the night sky, and you set it for time lapse to, to take a, a new shutter uh, click about every 10 to 15 seconds, all night long. By the end of the night, you'll have a video of all of the North Star fixed in one place and all of the other stars rotating around it in a perfect circle. If we were traveling through outer space at 66,000 miles per hour, it would be impossible for you to take pictures like that. Because your camera is always changing position, right? Your camera would always be changing uh, uh, its spot. You couldn't fix your focus on one place and keep it there as the, if the Earth is continually traveling at 66,000 miles per hour and rotating at 1,000 miles per hour. You wouldn't be able to take a video, a time-lapse video like that. So it tells me that the Earth must be fixed in one place, and the North Star must be fixed, everything else moving around it. Now, there have been astronomers much smarter than I am, of course all of you are much smarter than I am, who have studied this in more detail, and can, rather than the Earth and the other eight planets in our solar system revolving or orbiting around the Sun in perfect circles, like you see the normal charts, it simply means that that the planetary bodies we see in space, the Earth would be fixed, and everything else is orbiting around us, but in different patterns, which have to be allowed for, so that we see the same things at the same time every year, like clockwork. Now, that's, that's a little teaser, but I told you when... Felix Baumgartner went up and set the world's record for the highest free fall uh, jump, uh, and, I think 175,000 feet in outer space, I forget how many miles that was, and uh, they, they created a space capsule hoisted up by a weather balloon, and he got up to 175,000 feet, and he jumped out of that capsule with a space suit on, and um, cameras recording everything that he did. It took him eight minutes. It took him three hours to get up to that height. And then another eight minutes to free fall down and then open the parachute and land. He landed in the same spot he took off from over in, over in uh, New Mexico. If the Earth had been rotating eastward at 1,000 miles per hour, he would have been 3,000 miles farther west and fallen into the Pacific Ocean when he came back down. But he didn't. He came back down in the same spot he left three hours earlier. Which suggests to me that the Earth didn't go anywhere. The Earth didn't rotate anywhere. If you fly from Los Angeles to New York, non-stop flight, it's about five and a half to six hours, depending on the course they take. And 
uh, wind uh, resistance and so forth. But if you fly from New York to Los Angeles, it's about five and a half to six hours as well. If the Earth is rotating eastward and you're flying westward, your destination is coming towards you as you are heading towards it. You follow? <coughs> so rather than six hours from New York to LA, it should take you about 20 minutes. If the Earth were rotating towards you at a thousand miles an hour, you're flying opposite that. But it doesn't. As a matter of fact, if the Earth were rotating from west to east at a thousand miles per hour, and your plane is flying at about 500 miles per hour, you're never going to you're never going to reach your destination. It's traveling twice as fast as you are. So all of those things begin to make a a, 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 a circumstantial case at this point in my mind that. The Bible describes the sun as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber to run a race. It never describes the earth as running around the earth, running around the sun. So a lot more needs to be um, explored in that area, but I don't think it should be discounted as a great possibility. A lot of things that are said to be um, science, which may or uh, may not be scientific. Let's move on. Uh, verse 1 says, praise him in the heights. This will comprise the things following, in the following verses, angels and hosts, the sun, the moon, stars, the heavens, the waters that are above the heavens. These are seven things that are to praise God. God's spiritual and physical creations are to praise him. Verse 5, for he commanded and they were created. Nothing evolved. Nothing happened all by itself without any uh, intelligent direction behind it. Uh, they appeared in an instant by God's spoken word. Let's go to verses 7 through 14. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Now we're down under the first heaven. Verse 7, praise the Lord from the earth. The vapor, verse 8, will be what shows up in the cloud formations. There are 12, or rather 24 classes of things, two sets of 12, which are to praise the Lord. Uh, they are dragons, the deeps, fire, hail, snow, vapor, stormy wind, mountains, hills, fruitful trees, uh, cedars, beasts, cattle, creeping things, fowl, kings, people, princes, judges, young men, maidens, old men, children, and his saints, of which you and I are part. Some of the items are inorganic, that is, they're not consist they don't consist of living organisms as we think of it. They're in verses 8 and 9. Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees, and all cedars. Uh, he says, let them praise the name of the Lord, down in verse 13. It still holds true for those things as well. I got to thinking, they, they say that the, they say that the, the earth has this sort of um, ambient uh, hum, which they've detected coming from the earth. 
And when you think of the sound that wind makes as wind passes through trees or wind cuts through the air at a, the right <clears throat> speed and the right angle by your eardrum, you hear certain things. You pick up a seashell or you can pick up an empty coffee cup for that matter and the way the, the, the air blows through it, you hear a certain sound, right? Think of those things. Think of uh, harmonic sounds that they've detected coming from deep space, probably come from other planets, and uh, never mind how they're produced, that doesn't matter. And think of every sound uttered by every animal on the earth. The sound of cattle, the sound of horses, the sound of ducks and geese, the sound of every bird flying in the air, the sound of every animal uh, that, that walks upon the face of the earth that makes a sound. I don't know if flies make a sound, but we'll, take, we'll, let, we'll include them as well. Let's suppose that God has a way of combining all of the sounds which emanate from his creation, from every creature, from every, every animal, every bird, every whale, a, a, a creature in the ocean, whales and dolphins make sounds that they've, that they've recorded, um, and the, the ambient noise that comes from inorganic material, rocks and the hills. What if God has a way of combining all of those sounds into a certain melody that pleases him? When we talk about offering God praise, uh, much of the time we're talking about singing. We're talking about music. Singing praises to the Lord. What if God intends for all of those things, all of those sound-producing things one day to be blended together in such a way that bring glory and honor to Him as the creator of all of them? Things that to man's mind are discordant and they're, they're, they make no sense whatsoever. They have no, no pattern or formula to them that, that convey anything to us. Now, it's, it's a, a certainty, we, we know this much, that animals communicate with each other by particular sounds. We just don't know how to in translate them, right? We don't know how to interpret them all the time. And Dr. Ruckman was fond of pointing out that dogs, dogs can say about seven things. They can convey about seven things. They convey, I'm, I'm scared, uh, I'm hungry, I'm cold, I need to go out to go to the bathroom, and other things like that. They can convey about five, six, seven things. Beyond that, we don't know. Birds are natural singers, you would say, um, but you can't teach birds to sing four-part harmony, no matter how much you try. But let's suppose that God knows exactly what he's done and what he's going to do, and he'll combine all of those sounds throughout the universe to make a glorious um, chorus to his own praise and glory and honor one day, and the glory of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that everything that hath breath, praise the Lord, and things that don't seem to have breath, let those things praise the Lord as well. Um, but verse 7 says the dragons, and that's going to have, th those dragons are going to have to be slain by all the modern Bibles these we think of today. And so the modern Bibles don't like the word dragons. They think it's archaic. It's a throwback to kings and knights and castles and fair maidens and so forth and mythology and folklore. And they don't think that such a thing as a dragon could... Do you know what? Before the word dinosaur was ever used, they referred to such creatures uh, as dragons. The word dinosaur means a terrible lizard. And that word was only uh, coined about 18, in the 1840s or along in that time period. Before that, they referred to such uh, creatures that they knew of as dragons. That's how they were referred to. Um, but the vocabulary doesn't seem proper to modern speech. And so the revised version 
the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the New American Standard Version all say sea monsters rather than dragons. Uh, creatures of the ocean depths, according to the Living Bible. Great sea creatures, according to the New King James Version and the NIV. Um, sea monsters. How, how is it that uh, dragons are to be rejected, but mon sea monsters are to be okay? Why is one any better than the other? Uh, modern scholars complain that, or they insist rather, that translation be, should be consistent and uniform. Uh, but the only Bible that took the Hebrew word for dragons and translated it consistently was the King James Bible. All the other modern Bibles deviate or vary as to how they translate that word when they find it throughout the scriptures. Uh, some Bibles translate it as uh, serpent, some as sea creatures in certain places, some as reptiles, some as jackals, of all things, and some as monsters, depending on the reference. They translate it the same word different ways. The only Bible that's consistent in translating the same word the same way everywhere was the King James Bible. So they say one thing, but they do the other. Now, it doesn't mean that every word has to be translated the same way all the time. The word pascha in the New Testament, P-A-S-C-H-A, uh, occurs 29 times. And 28 of those times, it's translated as Passover. In Acts chapter 12, in one case, it's translated as Easter by the King James translators. The modern committees think the King James Bible was wrong for translating it as Easter. But as you read the context, Easter fits. Passover would not fit. We've talked about this many times when we get to that time of the year, we're talking about Easter and why Easter is a much better word because the Romans weren't waiting until after Passover to uh, let uh, uh, James out of prison, but they were waiting until Easter. Easter was a Roman holiday. It's a Roman Catholic holiday today, but it was a Roman um, governmental holiday at that time. And the way it fell, it says that it says the days of unleavened bread had already come and gone, and they were waiting until after Easter to let James out of prison. But if it was Passover, then you'd, be, then you'd think they'd have to wait another full year for the next Passover to come around. Then they'd, then they'd release James from prison. But that's, that didn't fit. Easter fits. That's why the King James Bible was superior than all the others in that case. But this psalm is fairly self-explanatory. It lists all those different groups and elements that should praise the Lord. Let's read verses 7 through uh, uh, 14 again. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps. Now, dragon, of course, is going to be a, a type of Satan. He's called Leviathan, Isaiah 27. But uh, Psalm 104, verse 26 uh, mentions Leviathan, but in that case, as a... a proper reference to whales. Genesis 1.21, one of the first things God made was whales and other creatures in the deep. But creatures on the earth are a type of Satan. Think of Job, or not Job, but Jonah, uh, a type of, a type of uh, Jesus Christ. Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So Jonah, the type of Christ, the whale, then a type of the grave, and Satan. God told Satan, thou shalt, uh, it, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He gained a minor victory over Jesus for a time, but then Christ will ultimately gain victory over him. So he defeated Christ and thought he, was, thought he had conquered Christ for three days and three nights in the tomb, uh, but Christ came back to life again. Now the judgment's going to come to Satan. He had his chance, and his chance he failed. So, so the whale is not only a type of Satan, a type of the grave, uh, and the whale, and the whale, or the creep of the dragons, as they're referred to sometimes, uh, on the earth, are also types of one in the waters above the heavens. That would be Satan, as he is described in Revelation 12, verse three, uh, seven heads and uh, seven crowns and ten horns upon his heads, and so forth. 
But verse um, 8, fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. That name is Jesus. That name is Jesus Christ. That, that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and there are things in heaven and things in earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, um, Philippians tells us. That name is excellent. We sing that beautiful name, that wonderful name, that matchless name is Jesus. And um, Jesus, Jehovah, means the Lord saves, or Jehovah saves, or the salvation of Jehovah is with us. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. To think that God would be, um, would humble himself to enter into his own creation uh, and live among his creation, to identify with men and go through the day-to-day -day, uh, needs that men have to satisfy, to be tempted in his flesh like men are, and yet for our sakes, we sang that song earlier, for our, how for us our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. He was tempted for our sakes, uh, and yet victorious over sin. That is, he, he understands what it is to be tempted, and yet was able to resist the temptation, not yield. Unlike men who yield as often as they can, hoping nobody finds out about it, and hoping that uh, no harm will come. But it says there, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. And that's true. God that made the heaven and the earth, by definition, is outside of heaven and earth. God does not dwell um, on a planet on the other side of a star called Kolob, like the Mormon God. God who made the visible universe is by definition outside of the visible universe. He's not bound by it. He's not bound by the rotation of the planets or the movement of the planets or the sun or the moon or anything else. He fixed those things so that you and I would know how to count uh, seconds and minutes and hours and days and years and seasons and we would have some mathematic predictability to the creation which would testify that there was a a, a genius God who made it all. It would be impossible to calculate God's IQ on a scale that we use, right? <laughs> Infinity. But it says there in verse 14, we'll close with this, He also exalted the horn of His people, the praise of all His saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto Him. That's not church-age believers, that's Israel. Those are the ones he calls his saints in the Old Testament. So when a Christian comes to the Old Testament, he reads verses that apply to God's saints. Literally, it applied to the nation of Israel. Devotionally, you extract from it God's blessing for you, God's care and concern for you as a New Testament believer, but not every detail attached to those descriptions uh, are necessarily for you. I'm thankful that God save me, but uh, I'm not a Jew, and uh, I'm not looking for a Messiah. I've already met the, the Messiah, who's also the Savior of my soul, and the forgiver of my sins, and has already written my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and promises to me a glorified body like the resurrected Son of God. And we talked last week, or I think we put that video up about how Gentiles are saved, um, Everyone today is saved by trusting in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary, whether Jew or Gentile. Right now, God is saving uh, individual sinners who will come to Christ and trust in His shed blood alone. 
And on that basis, Jews and Gentiles are united in something called the body of Christ, the church. And at the rapture, those Jews and Gentiles will both be caught up to be with Jesus Christ and receive glorified form just like he possesses. Those Jews left behind, uh, unsaved at the time of the rapture, uh, we, we pray and read in the scripture, we'll, many will turn to the Messiah and uh, flee the Antichrist, flee the mark of the beast, and they that endure to the end shall be saved. The Gentiles will then have to help the Jew in their worst time of persecution, and it's, and it's their assistance to the Jew and keeping the commandments of God by resisting the mark of the beast, abstaining from the, the, the mark of the beast and the man of sin, and survive to the end and enter into the millennium when Christ comes back with no marks on their hands, having helped the Jew in his time of trouble, and they all enter into the kingdom of Jesus Christ still physically alive. But, of course, uh, Christ will establish perfect government, perfect climate, perfect rule, um, and it'll be, it will literally be um, heaven on earth as the earth has never known before. But right now, Jews and Gentiles uh, must come to God the same way by trusting in Jesus Christ. But when this psalm was written, there was no New Testament church being described. And God, is, it says there in the last part of the verse, a people near unto him. If God had one race of people that he was close to, closer than any other race of people, it wouldn't be whitey. It wouldn't be white Gentiles and white Europeans who think they're superior because they're Caucasian. It wouldn't be Shemites who are not Jews. It wouldn't be Hamites in Africa who are not Jews. God's near to Israel and Israel's near to him. And then he says, praise ye the Lord. Think about everything that you see, the, the, the visible creation around you, everything that we interact with when we touch it, when we see it, when we smell it, when we hear it, the entire created universe around us uh, ultimately began with God's handiwork. He spoke and it came into existence. He spoke and the elements were there in the earth from which men have extracted and made different ores out of, different metals from, uh, different things from, from vegetable and animal and minerals that we use and live with. All of those things come from the earth and God made it all. So ultimately God uh, is responsible for the entire creation we see and therefore men ought to give praise to God, thank God for the, the world we live in. It would be pretty awkward if you existed without a world to stand on, without an earth and gravity to hold you in place. It would be pretty uncomfortable, pretty awkward to get around and do what you needed to do if you had no gravitational force to hang on to things, pick up things and reach things. So I'm glad God put it all together the way he did. 